Good morning, everyone. It's Wednesday, so that means another uh, watercolor demo. And, uh, sorry, I've got a little delay here. There we go. Okay, so, hi everybody, and uh, it's Wednesday. We finally made it to May, but we are not getting the most May-like weather. <laughs> May-like, it is, uh, it's been kind of a dreary week. The picture that I want to demonstrate today is a magnolia. And normally I would be out there taking pictures of them because they're all blooming right now, but right we have no sunshine. So when I'm taking photos of flowers and things like that for painting in watercolor, I usually look for sunshine because sunshines give me shadows. Shadows create form, which makes it a lot easier to make, to create the roundness, to create you know the the curves, all of those things. Much easier to see and paint, and it makes a more dynamic painting, I think. So um, I have, um, uh, I'm going to be using a, a reference image from um, uh, unsplash.com. Uh, it, it's a website that you can check out and it's got all kinds of um, copyright free uh, images that you can use. Photographers have uh, shared uh, their images with us. Uh, so that's a good one to check out. Good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, make sure you mention where you're from. I always love seeing where everybody's from. Everybody else likes seeing that too. And uh, we'll just jump right into this because we've got a bit of work to do today. Okay, so this is my reference picture. It actually printed pretty well. Uh, you know, this is this is the digital image, of course, and this is my, uh, you know, just the one I printed on regular paper. And uh, it actually printed fairly decent, but... Um, what I want to do with this one right now is I want to put in this dark background because without a dark background <laughs> This flower is not going to show up very well. So I want to get this background in here I also want to create some depth in my painting. So in order to do that I am going to be um, putting some of my flowers in the background out of focus so I'm going to preserve my actual um, blossom and the stem first, and then I'm going to be able to work really wet in wet for this background. So I want to be able to do this background sort of as quickly and efficiently as I can so that I can keep the softness that's there. So I'm going to do something a little different today because uh, normally I would use masking fluid to save my white uh, for something like this, as long as it has a hard edge, right? I could, I could use masking fluid for that. But today I'm going to use packing tape. This is just inexpensive packing tape, tears like like crazy. So it, you know, it's not high quality anything, but it's brown and you might be thinking, well, how, how's that gonna work? You'd be surprised, you can see through this pretty well. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to start right here at the edge. And look how easily you can see through it. So it, it's going to work just fine. So I'm going to tear off a piece of this. I don't want to cut into my paper, of course. I'll tear a piece of that off. You've got to watch these ends. If you lose these ends, <laughs> really hard to get back. Now, the next strip, it's very important because if I overlap too much, if I overlap this like a whole lot, then what's going to happen is first two things. I'm not going to be able to see through it very well because there'll be two layers. Secondly, um, I'll have two layers to cut through when I'm cutting the shape out. So I want to overlap it, but just barely. Oops, I didn't go high enough there. Let me go a little higher. Got to get the top of the magnolia. There we go, smooth it out nice. And see how easy that tears? It's the cheap, thin stuff. Next layer, same thing. I'm going to overlap it just barely.
You may have odd shapes, but tape is cheap. Go ahead and use the tape. Don't try to save tape and make your job harder. Okay, so next one, just once again, overlap and tear this off. And one last little piece right there. All right, so for this, and I should mention that I'm just going to fold this over <laughs> so I can find it again. But for this technique, I want to make sure it's, you know, I don't have a lot of air pockets and things like that underneath. I'm trying to make sure that it's nice and smooth. But I'm going to be using a retractable knife. Now, a retractable knife needs to have um, a very sharp blade. So you, if you don't know what the last thing you were cutting this with, or regardless of what you were cutting using this for last, you want to... Um, sorry, my, my computer wants to update right now. <laughs> there we go. Um, so what you want to do is you want to snap off a new blade. It is not worth the trouble of um, trying to work with a dull blade. You need to have a sharp blade. Absolute must, must. Now there's a little slot in the end of the blade, in the end of the knife here. You can see I'm putting my nail in there. And you simply pull this part off and snap off a new blade. This, this entire blade is new, so I'm not going to snap this one off, but that's what you would do is make sure you're starting with a fresh blade. So <clears throat> the other thing I want to do is I don't want to chop, 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 chop as I'm cutting this. You think the chances of you landing that little slice in the exact same spot every time is not going to happen. So I'm going to keep my blade on my paper as much as possible. And let me just going to move this out of the way here and I'm going to find this place where I can start. Now I could start here and I could work my way around sort of um, counterclockwise or something like that but I have a corner here. I can start in a corner. So I'm going to overlap it a little bit. I'm going to keep the blade low so if I keep it up straight like this it will stutter. You know what I mean by stutter? Uh, you know it'll kind of skip a little bit. So keep the blade low. In fact, I, I put my hand, I do kind of overhand type of thing, and I put this on there. Oh, thank you, Patricia. Yes, Patricia says, I highly recommend signing up for one of Shelley's reasonably priced Friday classes. Give them a try. Thank you very, very much. Um, yes, I do offer Zoom workshops. Um, Stay tuned because in the next few days, I'm going to be posting my May and June uh, workshops, um, but they're ongoing all the time. And if you want, if you can't wait, I have all kinds of um, uh, past workshops that I've done and those are all available. So um, check that out on this website, ShellyPrior.com. And uh, back to my cutting here. So I'm going to... Um, start going along the line as carefully as I can. No, not a lot of pressure and no, I'm not cutting through my paper. You can actually feel this tape. It is like thinner than paper, <laughs> actually. So I won't, I won't say it's paper thin. It is actually thinner than paper. So I am keeping the blade on the, on the paper. And I will manipulate my hand to get all of those things. Now watch as I do this because I'm going to keep my blade on here. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn my work around. And what this is doing for me is that it's giving me a continuous cut. And I can stop when I get to a 
like a really tight corner or something like that. Just sort of overlap your line. There we go, turning again. So right there, I'm in another corner and I can um, turn that again. So I'm going to zoom in on this so you can see this even a little bit closer. This will take about the same amount of time as masking, but we don't have to wait for things to dry and um, I don't have to worry about missing any um, parts of my flower. I know that my, no matter how much splashing I do, this flower will stay white. So that's the advantage to this. Clear packing tape can work well too. Yes, this one's actually a little thinner uh, than the, the clear packing tape, but both work. I've, I've used both. I've had no problems with either one. The other benefit to using the masking or to using the packing tape is that um, it, it sits on top of the paint paper and so you're not going to be using the um, the tool to erase and and abrase your uh, surface as well so this is a little gentler on the surface another benefit of this is that you know all these all these other lines that I have in here will stay there because masking fluid will take off your lines so if you've done some drawing and um, then you put masking over it. You're going to find that when you, the masking comes off, there goes the drawing too. So this is one good way to save your drawing and do this. But practice this on something other than something that's precious to you because it takes a little getting used to doing this, uh, this cutting. Uh, all right, so I'm going to continue on here. I'm going to come and I overlap that beginning a little bit just to make sure that I don't have a part that's going to tear when I pull the tape off. Okay, so there's some little ins and outs here. It's a wee bit awkward for me right now because I have the lights set up for the camera, which means glare for me. <laughs> Okay, little corner there. I can stop and lift my blade. But the key here is keep the blade on the paper as much as possible. If, however, something happens, and let's say I stop in the middle, it's like, oh my gosh, now I'm now I'm stuck. What I would do is sort of just no pressure at all, but I would slide this along until the blade sort of slips back into that cut and then I would continue because let's face it things happen corner I can stop and lift stop and lift here's kind of a round part that I have to do Now, if some of these parts seem a little too fiddly or fussy, like I wouldn't do this with something like horribly complicated. I probably would use uh, packing tape in the in the big areas, uh, but then use masking fluid. Sorry, I'll move that up. Masking fluid for um, like detail stuff. So sometimes I will use a combination of this packing tape and the uh, masking fluid. So I'm going to take some of this off just so you can see what is happening. Take it off slowly just in case, just in case you don't have a full cut. Look how nicely that comes off. You're not seeing all of this. All right, so I'm just going to tear the rest of that off. So you can see that that's working quite well. Um, that's, that was probably the fiddliest part. And um, I'll just come down here and quickly do this. 
no taking I'm not going to take the rest of it off till I have the rest of it cut so I'm going to better zoom out a bit here because you're gonna miss some of this corner. I can lift and move it if I have a corner. I can. That's a good place I can stop and turn things if I need, like right here. But if it's rounded, I try to keep the blade on the, on the paper. So there's a lot of benefits to this. Um, But uh, it, it will, everywhere that there's a cut, it will, um, well, you're cutting a little bit into the paper, and you know, as soon as the blade makes um, contact with it. What type of tape is this? This is packing tape. This one I got from a dollar store. I don't even remember which dollar store, but it is called Titan. This is a Titan one. Uh, but most most packing tapes are fine. The thinner the better actually. You know, you get the cheapest one. It actually works seems to work even better. And don't don't worry if it's brown because the brown packing tape and this is the plastic stuff it, it may look when I say brown I don't mean brown um, paper tape, I mean brown plastic tape. Or... Because it needs to repel the water. Paper tape won't work. <clears throat> So I would take my time with this. As I said, it would take about the same amount of time to mask this with masking fluid, but then you'd have to wait for it to dry. And this way I don't really have to wait. I'll be able to just pull this off and start painting. So I thought this would be a time saver, but it's also a way to show you a new technique that you may not have tried before. Um, if you have tried it, uh, make a comment and let me know how it works for you. But it might be new to some of you. Okay, this actually continues to there. And we're coming down just about at the end here, just coming down to the stem. And do I have that part cut? I do. All right, so reveal time. As I said, take it off slowly just in case of a missed bit, like here. I've missed a little bit of a cut there. Sometimes when you have two thicknesses, it requires a little extra cut. Let's make sure. Okay, I'm all right now. So don't rip it off too quickly. Or you might tear what you want to keep. This also works in reverse. So you can take off the, like if I wanted a, a light, or a, you know, if I wanted to do it the other way around and keep the background white and do a flower on and do it the other way, I could I could do this in reverse. I could keep the background and take away the tape on the on the actual flower. I'm just gonna my nails aren't getting this paper this tape is so thin I can't get my nail under it, so I'm gonna use the blade, pull it up. There we go. All right, so we have that, and before I start getting into painting and all of that sort of thing, yes, it is tape I'm cutting, Sally. It's um, packing tape. 
and uh, now I'm going to use like just the back of my nail here and really burnish down those edges. Really make sure that those are well secured. In the process of lifting the tape, it may have pulled up an edge. So you make sure you come in and really make sure that those are secure. all around just using the back of my nail back of my nail so that I don't scratch my paper of course all right so it goes right off to the edge I don't want a branch that's floating in midair so I like to take my branches right off to the edge now I have a nice um, background I can just I can get it as wet as I want I can I can work very freely with this background so that's the idea here to work in the background I want to use a very soft brush okay it, and this is important if you're using a synthetic brush what happens is that um, it it tends to drink up the paint more than it puts it down so you want a brush that you can really fill up and um, and just use a very, very light touch on the paper. You'll find that it will flow a lot nicer. Um, yes, yes. Um, you can actually put this on painted areas as well. Personally, I find it better works on plain paper, but you can, you know, if you if you painted a spot and you wanted to preserve it, you could do it that way too. You could put it on top. Um, people get more afraid by putting, uh, like by cutting something that they've already painted though. Um, but, but this works really well for me. And um, I want to mention that I have um, also, let's retract that knife so I don't cut myself. I've, um, softened up all of my paints here. I have, uh, about 15 minutes ago, I put generous amount of water in each of the wells to help the paint really get soft. That's going to give me the rich color that I'm looking for. So, um, looking at my reference picture, I'm seeing probably, I think that's cobalt blue. And, uh, there's some, a little bit of green in here too. There's, you know, obviously going to be some greenery too. And of course, some other magnolia blossoms that are out of focus. They're a little further away. Um, it's very challenging to, to, to photograph um, magnolias because they're, they're so clustered and so dense in the tree. It's hard to put the ones out of focus. So this is something that might be easier to photograph with a 35 millimeter camera um, using a, um, a lower f-stop. So, um, you know, if you're into photography and you can do that sort of thing, that you might find that helpful to get your background out of focus. Um, either that, or if you're on your phone, maybe try the portrait mode. Uh, might might be helpful for this. But in this particular instance, I chose this picture because of the light. Okay, we have good strong shadows. We have a well-defined uh, light source, and so it's a lot easier to tell that 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 blossom has like a like this this sort of curve that comes up like this and you can see that that is a shape and if that weren't there if this were just an overcast day that would be a lot harder to see so um, when I'm finding a photo to work from uh, for watercolor I usually look for something with with better contrast uh, I just find it makes a more impactful um, painting that's my preference so um, I'm going to start with my background. So I'm going to wet this background. Obviously, I'm not going to paint into some of the areas because they need to stay white. But I will start with the light colors first. So I'm not going to start with this dark. The dark will come last. And uh, I'm just going to begin on wet. Now, wet because I want to keep the, um, <clears throat> the edges all soft. So whenever you want all those edges soft, wet's the way to go soft brush fill up that paper keep the paper wet enough 
And I often will say this to um, my students is that they, you know, they'll, they'll say, but I wet it. But you probably didn't wet it enough because the first thing that happens with cotton paper is, wow, it, it's really absorbent. It's shockingly absorbent. You know, if you're, if you're used to working on inexpensive paper, um, I'm working on Arches 140 pound cold press paper, which is 100% cotton. So um, I will um, really fill it up. By filling up the paper, the paint can stay on top. Otherwise, you put the paint on and the paint soaks in because just because of the absorbency. So to take away some of the absorbency, we fill up the paper. Once a sponge is full, it can't pick up more, right? So it's the same idea. Fill your sponge, or in this case, fill your paper. And I'm just wiping the beads of water off my off my magnolia blossom that I taped. There we go. And I'm going to use a smaller brush for some of these um, blossoms in the background just to get some of the colors in there. Um, I'm going to go permanent rose for this. Some permanent rose. There'll be a little bit of uh, cobalt blue as well, but not that bright. I'll put a little bit of, I'll put a little neutral tint into this. So my blue's not too bright. It's more of a blue gray that I've got here. And uh, I've got my permanent rose. All right, so into my wet paper and with my small brush, small so that it doesn't hold too much paint, I'm just going to start implying where some of these blossoms are. And how nice that I don't even have to worry about uh, the magnolia that I'm trying to, that'll be the main subject. So uh, I see a little bit of yellow in here too, so I'll go a little bit of gamboge. Mine's a hue, it's, um, this one is a Da Vinci gamboge and it's a hue, which means it's a mixture. Um, all right, we'll put some of these yellows into, into this background as well. Really doesn't matter too much where every, all these things go. We don't have to be that precise because it's out of focus. I just need to hint at where they are. Now there's a number of ways I could do this background. I could do the bokeh background. If you saw my other demo um, a few weeks back, I did one of a um, of a robin sitting on a nest, and I did the bokeh background on that. So if you like the bokeh background, it's um, bokeh is an effect that you get with your camera where you. Um, you have highlights in the background, but the background's out of focus. So those highlights become very uh, uh, round and and sort of blown, like oversized and very soft. Soft it ends up looking like soft circles. Okay, so I'm putting lots of blues in here now. Some of these blue grays first. And now I want to go some just clean cobalt blue here. And I'm working around a few of the areas that I want to keep white because, of course, they have to stay white. Now, if at some point this begins to dry, I can grab my spray bottle and spritz it. And that will keep things activated or the, keep the moisture. And if my brush, if my brush is too full, if my brush is really, really wet, um, what happens is it starts to, it starts crawling and, you know, it starts spreading out. So if I'm trying to keep a particular shape, so for example, 
right here. I want to keep this shape. I'll just take my brush and blot it well and drink up and pull some of that off. Just make sure my brush is clean and blotted. You can see I'm blotting it here on this paper towel. Blot it well and drink it up right? to keep those, those areas lighter. It doesn't matter that it's fuzzy. It's, it's all fuzzy. And now I'm going to go to a little bit bigger brush because I want to start filling in some of these other darks. But I'm going to get some blues up in here. Pretty colorful at the moment, but by the time I put these pa the Payne's gray in here, it's going to get a lot darker. Um, oh, thanks, Marilyn. Uh, you rip. Oh yes, yeah, sometimes you can. Well, if you're ripping the paper with masking fluid, that often is the type of paper that you're using because some papers. I have found the same thing that some papers will. Um, will tear. They don't. St they're not as durable, so you need a durable paper. And I'm coming in with my Payne's gray here and putting it in as uh, like kind of a creamy consistency because I, I don't want to do this four times. I want to do it once, <laughs> if possible. So I'm going to come in with this and get my color really rich. Payne's gray is one of those colors that can get to dark really fast. Um, which is why I kind of enjoy using it. Now down here, my paint is a little thicker now. As I said, it's kind of creamy, dense color. I'm going to come down here and try to get a little shape out of this. Let me see. A little shape in here so I'm making sure my paint's gray isn't too watery. I'm gonna put a little more blue in here. And let that just sort of mingle and melt together. Paint's gray again. As the paper starts to get drier, so does my brush. It has to. If my brush doesn't get drier, the only thing I'm going to accomplish is blossoms. Keep moving here. Just come along and gotta move fast. So, as I said, um, if things do start drying on you, what do you do? You take your spray bottle and help keep the moisture. So, I'm gonna grab that in a second. I should have had it at on the ready, but I did not. So, come in here. A little more cobalt blue into this section. And the idea here, and this is very important, when you are doing a background such as this, each of the colors needs to be the same consistency. If you have one that is wetter than the other, it will push back at the one that's drier. It will push back at the one that's drier. I said that twice because it's really important. <laughs> so by making sure that um, the paints are all the same consistency. So this has been sitting here for a minute. It's a little bit drier. So I better make sure that the paints gray I put down isn't runny or that I haven't put my brush into my water and made my brush really wet and that sort of thing. Oh, that's okay. My name gets sp spelled wrong all the time. It is the most common. 
it, spelling it without the e on e y on the end is the most common mistake I get. It and everybody it it's you're not alone. <laughs> I actually hardly even notice anymore because it's so, I'm so used to looking at people spelling it wrong. I just kind of like, oh, well, whatever. <laughs> so. I'm just kind of guessing at some of these shapes. It, it doesn't have to be precise. I didn't put it on my line drawing. If I did, you know, put it in my line drawing, I would have had to have, I'd, I'd have been so committed to it. I wouldn't have been able to have any um, opportunity for this to uh, <clears throat> be a little bit uh, flowing and creative. Plus, I'd have lines in my background. I don't want that. So, I'm just going to go over some of this, dull it down. See how fat, how I easily I can dull things down. That's why I start really bright, and then I can mute things um, really easy just by bringing some of the other color in. So let's go up here and around this. Oh, there's kind of a shape there. This is a really wet spot, so the paper's probably wrinkled right there. And uh given me a, a wrinkle. Okay, so I've put Payne's Gray here. Uh, that was actually on purpose because I wanted to get some of the, uh, there's like this little curl on this this petal here that I wanted to show. So I, if, if I want that to show, I'm deliberately putting some dark behind it. So you can do that. The photographer doesn't have the choice. You know, they have what they see is what they photograph. But I have that choice as an artist, so that's what I'm doing. So these are my out of focus uh, background flowers. I'm just coming in with, you know, more color in a few places, more, more richness, and. Uh, I think I need a little bit more something down here. This looks a little bright. This looks a little bright, this looks a little dull, so I'm going to pull some of that off and pull some of that off. I can I can soften stuff. Look at how I can drink up paint if I need to. If I want to keep an area soft or contained, I can just use my brush as a tool as for controlling edges to somewhat something of a degree there we can don't want to dry it I don't want to blot my paper towel on my paper or something like that but I can Maintain some shapes here. I have to keep rinsing my brush though. That is that is the one thing I need to do. Now you could have a little fun. If you wanted to throw some salt into this, I mean, that it's your painting. You get to do whatever you want. But I'm going to put a little bit of grayness down here. This is nice and all, but it's it's just a little bit too... Too much attention for that corner, I feel. So I'll just put a little bit more gray here. And I might even dull down some of this pink because this pink is just a little bit too much of a candy pink and it doesn't need to be that bright so I just put a little bit of Payne's Gray into it and voila I have a dull dull pink now that was a little wet so i am got to drink some of that off and just about done with this background 
But I want to take this brush, this thirsty brush, one that's blotted, and I want to pull up the, the paint from my tape. It's going to take a lot longer for the paint on the tape to dry than it will on the paper. So I'm pulling some of that off with my brush. And I will gently try to pull some of that off with paper towel too. So I'll do my edges. I'll wipe this off. And even though this background's really dark, I wanted to get that in first because um, the, um, the flower is so light, it would be very difficult for me to get the values right. I would, I would probably be working much too softly on the magnolia blossom because if I see it against white paper, it feels like it's dark. But when you see it against dark, it's, it'll be more the correct value. So it's a lot easier for me to judge what the values are going to be if I have something dark in there early on in my paint, in my process. So I'm going to drink up all this uh, stuff on my on my tape. Just be careful of your background. But it isn't this part's really important. You pull off the pull off the moisture. All right, so I don't have to get every speck off, but I do need to get those those bigger drips and things because if I take a blow dryer to this right now and dry this, and one of those little beads goes rolling off of the tape and onto my paper, I'm, I'm make, making blossoms. So I really have to make sure that I that's not a possibility. So I'm going to use my tool here. This is a heat tool. Um, it's used more for embossing, but um, it will dry it without so much noise. So I'll use this and hopefully it won't make a lot of noise. Get rid of some of my garbage on my table here because it's going to go flying if I don't uh, <laughs> if I don't move stuff. Actually, this doesn't blow that much air anyway, so I'll get this fully dry and then I'll take off my tape and painting the flower will be a fairly straightforward process at that point. But in this this is one instance where the flower itself uh, or the background is almost as important as the flower because it's the setting. In the last couple of weeks I talked about painting eyes and painting a mouth and things like that and if you don't paint what's around it and put it into proper context it makes it a lot, a lot more challenging to to get those values right and to make it look right you know it just doesn't seem right when you do that. So a background like this, I mean you, this is more sort of literal to what I have on the reference picture but you can get creative with this. You can spatter, you can put salt in there. Um, don't be afraid to experiment a little bit with your painting. <laughs> my, my tape's not liking the heat too much, it's wrinkling. Well, we'll see. I don't want to, I don't want to cook it on there or melt the, melt the glue too much. So we'll just see what I can do with the, the, the shine is gone off of this. So let me see if I can remove some of this and continue the drawing. So I'll just gently, you see how sideways here, I'm just going to get under this edge, pull this up. So this will come off and so in many ways this can be a lot faster than masking fluid. There are some people that just, you know, have had a bad experience with masking fluid so they stay away from it completely. This might be a good option for you, although it doesn't really help you too much with really fine details, but 
it's a good option. It's coming off in pieces. See, it's so so fragile. This this tape is so inexpensive that it um, it tears too easy. <laughs> it's sticking to me. Just a little bit right there. Just got to get an edge up. My paper still isn't 100% dry. I still have more to do on this. Just about there. Oops. <laughs> no pressure. Right. This is the last little bit of the stem. And you can see how effective it is uh, for preserving. There's no pin pinholes. Sometimes with masking fluid you can get like a little bubble. And if the bubble bursts or pops while it's on your paper, you get little pinholes. Plus, it's just easy to miss a little, um, a little spot, right? So I'm gonna get my tool out again now that the tape is out of the way, and I can dry this very quickly. So I did wet this background in order to keep everything soft, but you really have to be um, you have to put that paint on quite uh, quite uh, what's the word creamy like lots and lots of pigment which is why I softened up my paints at the beginning but um, you need to get that paint on there very um, like almost 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 like right out of the tube so that you can get the the, the richness of color because when you wet a surface first you're actually adding, like diluting the color that you're putting down. So you have to go kind of compensate for that and make sure that your paint's a lot darker. So it, as you're, you know, putting your tape on and, and saving this and everything, think about what you want in focus because you'd only do the shapes around things you want sharp edges on, not this background stuff. <clears throat> the other thing to remember is when you're doing the background keep each color like what's on the paper and what's in your brush should be a similar consistency don't make one wetter than the other they should be the same if you want them to play together nicely your brush can actually be a little drier than the paper itself. Just making sure this is well dry. So what's in your brush can be drier than the paper, but it shouldn't be the other way around, unless your intention is to create blossoms. And actually a background with watercolor blossoms um, could actually be a very nice background but it would give you more busyness in the background. This is a little more gentle. Okay, so I'm gonna let that cool down a bit here. And in the meantime, set that on the floor. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to start thinking about my colors for my, uh, for my magnolia. So I used a bit of that permanent rose, which I'll use. I dulled it with some Payne's Gray. I also dulled some of my Cobalt Blue with the Payne's Gray. So I'm going to use some of those for, uh, for this. And, um, and I will use maybe just a little bit more of a Payne's Gray 
by itself over here. So I'm going to create my puddles of color like this. I will put my blue here. I will put Payne's Gray beside it. And in the middle, they can mix. And then I can have any range of, of those, uh, you know, that color from pure color to dulled color to dark color. And I'll do the same with my permanent rose. Payne's Gray. Similar consistency. And in the middle, stir them. So then I get different different values there. All right, so I am going to start, I'm actually gonna use a little bit of this, this um, I'm gonna bring some raw sienna into this, I think, raw sienna. And I don't want it quite that yellow though, that, that nice golden raw sienna color. So I'll put just a tiny bit of Payne's Gray into this too. Just a tiny bit, right? Just to dull that color down a little bit so it looks like a dull gold. And <clears throat> so I'm gonna really thin this down and I'm gonna begin right, make sure my paper's cool enough right up here and I am working on dry <clears throat> but I am going to start painting this this shadow right here and I'm going to start with this color and my brush is filled up this is a synthet or sorry this is a squirrel hair brush and that means that it is natural hair it's very soft I'm going to go a little bit more gray here. Let's get a little bit of gray. It's going to get darker as we come down. So I'm going to pick up a little bit of this. But this natural hair brush is soft enough for me to do this. And you see how I just switched colors there. Same consistency. And now they are, are melting into each other. I'm going to go a little bit of this blue gray here and I just continue on. Now I'm not stirring any of this together, I'm just letting these colors mingle together on the paper. And now I'm going to get some more of this permanent rose. My clean permanent rose keeps filling in there. <laughs> Let's get this. And darker as it comes down. So it's going to get quite dark as it comes down to this as it comes down to this stem, I guess. But as I was mixing paint there, look what happened. I got a little bit of a blossom. So I'm going to come up here with clean water and make sure all of this is the same consistency. I mean, I keep talking about the same consistency to help colors blend and I, if, if I miss it, because it happens, right? I will come back in and make sure it's all the same consistency. So I just kind of go back to the beginning and get these things melting together. I want to get a little bit more blue in here. Get that. And for a blossom that's really light in color, this is actually surprisingly dark in the shadows. So this is going to get almost Payne's Gray down here.
which seems very, um, <laughs> like it seems like, oh my gosh, that's way too dark. And our brains are going, no, it's too dark. And our eyes are going, no, it's not, it's fine. <laughs> Trust your eyes, not your brain. All right, so I'm trying to get that mingled together. So I actually have several colors in there, but uh, I want to go to this one now. I've, oh, I forgot to draw that in, but I would. I think I can wing this one. This is kind of a blue gray. This one. All right, so I'm going to come in along the edge here. And this is a cast shadow on here. This is probably this petal making the shadow on the one below. And then it's got a round shape here. And as I come down closer, I see, oh, it actually gets a little lighter again and a little bit pink. So I'm going to take a little pink right here. Oh, got to be careful. I'm going to make a blossom on my next petal. And I'm going to leave this part light right at, there's a little bounce back light or maybe there's no Maybe the light is illuminating the, the petal there, and it's giving me that. <clears throat> and it looks so dark, doesn't it? But by the time all of it's done, so you have to kind of trust this process, right? When By the time it's all done, it'll look right. But right now, it sure doesn't. <laughs> it looks like it's really dark. Um, all right, so I'm going to start the same process here. This... This petal here is going to have a little bit more warmth to it. It's actually a little bit bluish up here, so I'm going to put the slightest bit of color here. And then it comes down and it starts getting pink. So you notice what I'm really focusing on here is transitions. So from one color to the next. Actually, the entire painting is this way. We've got transitions happening in our background. We've got transitions happening in our um, in our our flower. I want to get a little darker in here, leaving that bright edge there. There's a little bit of a bright edge on the edge of that uh, that one petal. Rinse out my brush there. Get that blended as much as possible. Now that one's, compared to the others, that one's a little bit lighter. So we don't have quite as much color in this one. But I need a little bit because that's what's really making the edge of this, the petal behind, is what's making the edge of this one show up. Oh, thank you. Um, just reading some of the comments here. The pink I'm using in my painting is permanent rose. Um, opus could be a an option, but it would be a more uh, a livelier pink. It would be a, a, more of that neon type of pink. But yeah, it, it actually could be. I didn't really see this as that type of a pink though, so I, I opted for the permanent rose. Um, okay, I think I'm caught up on comments here. Uh, if I missed you, just ask it again and I'll, I'll, I'll make sure I answer your question. So I want to come up to the this shadow here. This part of the petal, the actual petal, is white, but because of the form here, just like down here, we have, um, you know, 
this this gray color. So I'm going to use a bit of my blue gray, but pretty diluted here. I don't want to have don't want to kill it with too much contrast. And I'm going to come into this shape and my brush is really full because if it's not really full, I'm going to run out part way through and I won't get the whole thing in without it looking patchy. And then this curls up and makes a shadow on itself. <laughs> this end of the petal here. So I'm going to rinse my brush out and blot it. Just pick up a little bit of color just so I can get a broken edge. So I can just get a little bit of roughness to this. And just a little bit of color up here in the tip. Not much. It's pretty subtle. I actually think I've gone too light there. I'm going to put maybe just a little bit more color down in here and let that melt in. I'll make some of this shadow a little bit stronger as well. Don't forget watercolor is always going to dry about 20-25% lighter. You have to compensate for that. Now I wanna, I've got a bit of a hard edge forming here so I'm just going to take my blotted brush and tickle that to get that soft so it doesn't create too much of a hard edge there. I don't mind that there's a little bit of texture. And even more diluted, I'm going to come down into the, the rest of the petal here. Hardly any color in my brush at the moment. Just barely getting any color in there. This looks like a crazy, crazy flower at the moment. But we need the darks. If you want the whites to look really white, you need the darks. They have to be there, so. I'm gonna come back to my pinks. And actually I'm going to thin down this pink and I'm going to do this one on the outside. I'm going to start down here. And just come along this edge. Well, I could have wet this petal first. That would have been another option. But I, if I'm quick about it, I could just come in and put some clean water along here and get that to blend by itself. And then the rest of that's pretty light. So I'm going to come up now to this this little curling part with just a little bit of blue gray. Get the shape in there nice. Finish it up with my gold color. Because if they're the same consistency, they'll blend together really nice. And I think I can come in here. I'll, I'll actually come back to that just in case. I don't want to take any chances. Uh, I'm going to get a little bit of
Um, I'm just trying to find the spot here. All right, I'm going to come down into my yellows. So I was using Gamboge Hue. I'm going to put some of that on this green leaf here. I will come into the uh, base of the flower as well. It comes right down to about this bud part and then it starts to transition to the reds. So I'm just going to continue down the stem but I will switch to the reds. That was my permanent rose. Could have gone a little bit cleaner right there, so I'm going to just swap that out and put some clean color down there. I can change my mind part way through. You know, if I have a correction to make, I just do it quick. You know, put that cleaner pink in there, so make it a little bit brighter. It'll push back at the other color and make that cleaner color. I'm going to drop a little bit of pink into some of these areas as well while it's wet so that I get more interesting um, blending of color, kind of cross-pollinate these, these colors in here. Um, And I'm going to come up and do this one right in here. Come right down into that point. I have to use the point of my brush. I do like these brushes. They, they do come to a really nice point. These are um, squirrel hair brushes. And I'm going to rinse and just use clean water so that this fades as it goes up the up the petal. Oops. No, that's fine. That's there. And that kind of just disappears. All right. So we're starting to get some form here, but. Uh, we have to get the dark in, in the bottom of this one because it looks really bizarre without. But I can't do that until this one's dry now. We can hurry that along with, with my heat tool. Me too, Bobby. I bought a second set as well. Now there's going to be a few cast shadows that we put in here as well, but I'm going to do the soft stuff first. Alright, allow that to cool slightly before I actually paint into it. So I'm going to use clean water and just wet this wet this petal. So there's a couple of things I want to do here. I uh, want to put the, the pink in here, but I also want to come in afterwards and put a few of those little you know, telltale veins that they have in the flower. So that it actually comes up and makes these little veins. So I'm using the point of my brush and I'm, I'm coming in towards the dark because if I go out 
it leaves a little like a little pom-pom of uh, <laughs> of color at the end of my stroke so I come inward instead I'm gonna get a little darker as I come down don't want to get too dark right there pull some of that off it's actually got to stay a little bit light right there so And it gets surprisingly dark right down in here. Just like just like this other one gets that extra dark. Well this won't look this will look weird until we get some of the darks in the greens as well. So hang in there. <laughs> it's it's still coming. We're still in the process. We have to keep all of it in mind. Let's get this a little bit light. I got it that a little bit too dark there, so pull some of that off. And there's kind of a diagonal line that comes here, so I'm going to try and get that in there a little bit soft if I can. Go get that dark in there, and now I want to start thinking about um, some of the darks that are going to be down here in the uh, in the stem and in the bract. I think it's called a bract. Is there some reason for using Payne's Gray? Because Payne's Gray is cooler. That is why um, I use that. And because I used it in my background, I could use neutral tint. Neutral tint would have been also a very nice choice. But uh, I was just trying to stay with a limited palette here. I guess that's more my reasoning than anything else. So I'm going to take my Ariolan Cobalt Blue. And I can get my greens in here. Lots of Ariolan because it's... I want a yellowy green. What's in the sun is very pale. What is in the mid value is uh, the cleanest or the brightest part of the color. And then in the shadow, you have the dullest color. So I'm going to add a little bit more blue to some of this. Start shifting it. And now into more of my my gray Payne's gray here, which is going to pretty much turn this uh, dark green. I think I want to dampen this first. It's I don't want to have really stark lines, so I'm just going to dampen this first. This little portion right there. And I'm coming in with this really dark green. Tip of my brush to get this, this effect. All right, still a little too bright. I can dull it down. I can always dull it down. I can't get it bright again. <laughs> and we guard these these things. These aren't even expensive brushes, these ones. These are, I, I mean, I, I just got them from, you know, online. Got them online and uh, they're not expensive, but I really enjoy them quite a lot. So I'm going to just keep coming in and darkening up a few things. Uh, it's like a triangle shape here. I don't know what that is. I guess that's a kind of a stem thing. And now I'm really kind of coming in with some of these extra darks here. Really 
getting lots of the Payne's Gray into it. I think I've mentioned this before, but yellow and Payne's Gray make a nice green. So if you need to get a dark green, uh, try mixing one of your yellows with Payne's Gray. It makes a great green. And I'm just using the tip to imply some of the some of the detail, but otherwise I'm just putting in sort of broader strokes. I'm just building it and building it little by little. And I'm going to switch over to my um, Payne's Gray and Permanent Rose combination and get some of the darks on this stem. Including this little bud. I'll just come down there with that. Now if I want to make this look round, it's probably better if I don't have a, a really crisp edge there. So I'm going to just take my brush and blot it and just run my brush down this highlight, just catching that edge and that will soften that. Let's put a little more, a little more Payne's Gray into this. I think I want to get this a little bit darker just on this lower edge. The light is coming from above, obviously. So this is just Payne's Gray I'm using right now to come in and get that a little bit darker there. And, and some of it's going to bleed into what I've done, but that's okay because that just makes that look round. And um, now all this stuff that's looking too bright, I can just paint over top of it and voila, it turns much darker and duller. Just add a little bit more color to a couple of places and and that all will melt together and just there's just enough of what's under there to to um, still show through but it looks more natural everything sort of softened and blended uh, not so bright but it's really getting some glow to it now I really have to get a little darker here though because look how light that has dried. So now it's building, 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 building and getting these a little darker. <laughs> I'm just laughing at your sleeping at night. <laughs> sleeping at night knowing you have a second set of brushes. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to uh, start building these things up because I've really got some some more color to put in here. These cast shadows need to be stronger. So now I'm put I'm working on dry, but I am softening edges as I go. And that's the type of thing that's really going to, you know, help this come, come to life. And this one looks so dark when we did it at the beginning, didn't it? And look at it now. It's like wimpy. So got to come in and get this a lot stronger. Rinse my brush, clean water here. I think I'm going to steal a little bit of blue and put that in there. 
That blue is quite nice. It helps to create that form a little bit more. That's what I see anyway. Now when you think of it, I have all the primaries in here. It looks like a rainbow. But um, if I, if I um, start mixing, stirring it up too much, uh, it's going to turn into mud instead. So it looks brilliant when it's wet, but when it's dry, it's going to be much more subdued. It's not going to be as technicolor as it seems when it's wet. So I think that's part of what kind of holds us up, a, uh, holds us back a lot is, you know, we see all this like bright color and then we, we rein it in and then it dries and it dries duller. So keep in mind what's going to dry duller. Not every color will dry duller. Did I, did I use the tape on your crocus background? No, uh, that one I didn't. Uh, the crocus background was done differently. That's actually a demo. So you can look at that one, uh, how I did that one. I think this is the only one I've done the tape on, but I I could be wrong. I've forgotten what I've done. <laughs> so I may have done it, but don't remember. The name of my brushes. Uh, the name, this one's called Baya Elk, which is, um, I'll type it in if I can. Type it in here for you in the chat so you can see that. Enter. There. That's what it's called. Uh, well, only with a capital, <laughs> of course. By a elk. It's a weird name. Alright, so I, I kind of made a mess up here. This doesn't look very good. Let's see if I can get a better job up here and down this, down this petal. So brighter, brighter pink here, get a little bit more oomph into this. There we go, a little more color. That's what that's what's needed right right now is a little bit of color. I'm just going to build this up a little bit more. Kind of feels like it's going too dark, but it's going to dry lighter. Just a little bit of dry brush in a couple of spots, just because the the petal isn't totally smooth. It actually has a little tiny bit of texture. Bring some of that blue down as well, and I think I'm nearly done here. I don't know that I need to do too much else. Um, I think I would. I think I would tone down a little bit of what's in this background. So here's what I would, I would suggest: if you find that you have like something in the background that's like looks unfinished. Like this one here needs a little bit of something, but I don't want to create a hard edge. So what I'm going to do is just dampen it. Did I use tape on? Oh, no, okay. I'm just making sure I didn't miss any questions. No, I think I'm okay. So just damp, all right, and working around my my uh, flower here. 
Now, here's the secret. As I get my thing to zoom in, if I don't want to create a blossom here, I blot my brush and make kind of a transitional, I guess for lack of a better word, but a transitional damp, dampening of that paper. So it's a little wetter here, then it's damp, and then it's dry, right? So you're, you're creating that different moisture. Here it's wetter, but I blot my brush and dry it. Blot my brush more, come out a little further and dry it. So this is almost like I'm not picking anything up or adding much on, just a slight bit of dampness. So as I come in and put a little bit of color into here, so let's put a little bit of this blue-gray in here, for example. It does have a little bit of white white area there but that is so much more soft now and I didn't make a blossom so so that's important to know I can add to a blurry background even even if it's dry so wet there blot go around it with a brush that's really blotted. And then what happens is you put the wet paint down and the, the fact that it gets a little drier as it goes out into the dark means that it's going to slow down any paint traveling out and creating a blossom. So a little paint's gray up in here. I'm going to rinse my brush and Soften this a little bit more, so I, I have more control than than I used to think I have. <laughs> you know, I used to think, oh no, I can't do anything, but yes, I can. So I'm going to use a little, maybe a little pink down in the end of this one. It's kind of that that color there. I didn't want to put that on totally dry paper because it would just it would just grab like you know it would make a hard line instantly but if I just dampen it ever so slightly I can get that little bit of um, dampness to paint into all right so I think I'll put this one out of focus too or not out of focus but I'm going to um, put some more color into this That actually has a hard outline, so that's fine. Okay, I'm going to squint my eyes and look at my paint picture, and look at look at my painting or my photo side by side. Let me zoom out. So you can see what I see, all right? And um, yeah, a little, maybe a little darkening here, not much, just a little bit. And I think this one is a wrap. So this is a bit of a cast shadow, so it's a little darker. Thought that was dry, it wasn't completely dry, but. I need to darken the bottom of this petal as well. Rinse and blot and soften this. And you can see why I'm why I look for a reference picture um, the that has a lot of sun in it because wow, the sun just makes it like so much more dimensional. Um, I am not using hot pressed paper, I'm using cold pressed paper. One 
40 pound arches cold press paper is what I'm using. I still find this one a little distracting. I know it's in the reference picture, but I find it a little distracting. I'm going to tone that down. So I'm going to dampen this and put a little bit more color in here just so it's not too distracting. Oh, it's got a little pink in it. Maybe we'll do a bit of pink in it. There. Just calm it down a little bit more. And maybe this little spot in here needs a little something. There we go. And uh, yeah, and it, it, it looks like it has a dark outline right now, but that's only because it's a little bit damp. Anyway, so we're calling this a wrap for today. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, make sure that you check out my Zoom workshops. Uh, they'll be posted on Friday. I had said that they would be posted today, but life got in the way and they're going to be posted Friday. So um, no Zoom workshop this Friday, but... Um, after this, we're good to go. And I've got some great stuff coming up. So be sure and check that out. All right. Have a great week, everybody. Take care. Bye.